Are we just about ready, sir? <laughs> okay. Welcome, everybody, to the August 6th edition of Recite. Um, and Recite is this thing where we all get together, and it started with people reciting poetry over at Montvert three and a half years ago, working on four years this fall. Um, but it's mostly poetry, sometimes prose, occasionally a song. Um, it can be memorized, it can be not memorized, it can be, it, we're, we're a loose group, but um, <laughs> it's, <laughs> but we have a good time. And Macy films it every single month, thank you Macy, for WCTV8, and then it shows up on his website, and you can, so you can see all of the past editions of Recite there. And, um, and it's fun to go back sometimes and visit some of the things that happened. Um, Tonight, we have a good eight to ten people who want to read, and if there's anyone who's not on the list yet who would like to be, just let me know. I'll ask you later. There's, um, we'll do a few people, then have an intermission, and then do the rest. Um, sometimes I show up here with poetry to read, and I don't have any of that tonight. <laughs> um, Toni Morrison died last night. Um, she was 88 years old. She was an amazing woman. Um, we don't have, and I thought of her as a poet, but I don't know that she has books of poetry out. She might have like little random poets here and there, but it's mostly prose, and we have a bunch of her books out there that can be um, checked out. And so if anyone needs to check out some Toni Morrison to just, you know, celebrate her, do that. But tonight we will do poetry, and we will start with Yash Dembinski. Oh wait, one more thing, sorry. We have our book here. This, this book we do every month. We, um, we put this out and it's just sort of a record of who has been here. If you wanna sign, if you wanna write notes about the evening or what you read or just whatever, um, sign it. We would love to have any comments you would like. It's for posterity. Thank you. So Yash Dembinski. Yeah, the uh, idea for this occurred to me Actually, I have no idea how it occurred to me, but my feeling about it is you can seriously doubt, reasonably doubt, whether there, whether there is or not a book of life, but if you're here, <laughs> you will find a book of recite. So, kind of ironic, right? Okay, um, so we're taking a break from Moses just because I'm going to, um, I'm going to be busy later this month and I'm very anxious about a long bike event in France. Uh, so I don't know if I'll get another chapter done, but I will have a chapter for September, or part of a chapter. Um, so I'm gonna present three poems, another Rilke sonnet, um, and this guy speaks to me so loudly and so clearly, and it's just amazing that this is the poem that I uh, flip to for this month uh, in light of my big bike event. It goes like this. We are the driving ones. Oh, but the stride of time, take it as trifle in the ever remaining. All that is hurrying will now, <laughs> will soon be over. No, I think it's will now be over anyway. Uh, will now, no, all that is hurrying has already happened. For first the abiding initiates us. O oh boys, fling your courage not into speediness or flight trials. These are rested. Light and darkness, flower and book. Wow, right? For poets, you know? Somebody called him the... Uh, was writing about his father who loved Rilke and uh, his father would often say, he is the poet for poets. <laughs> so I guess maybe that makes me a poet if I like him. All right, uh, the next poem I do like reciting this um, very much, and it's a summer poem, and uh, if not now, when? So it goes like this. 
surfer, and I'm gonna, I, I wrote it in the masculine tense because I wrote it when I was Tennessee, in Tennessee and landlocked and yearning for the ocean and yearning for my uh, younger days of being a surfer. And, um, but uh, my daughter, my Uh, my oh. anyway, I was going to try to change the tense. My oldest daughter is still a surfer, and I wanted to I wanted to uh, put it all in the feminine tense. So, uh, but I'll have to let her do that. So I'll, I'll do it in the masculine tense. Here we go. Uh, he stood on the beach with reflecting eyes, gauging his harmony with the waves' own swell and fall to the beach on which he stood. The vision of him surfing, of paddling, catching, sliding, dropping, crouching, standing, of standing on a board, surfing a wave, trembled in him like the ocean before. A caw of a seagull, its raucous cry, a smooth gliding ease on the wind he saw, then ran into the ocean like you and I rush into our beloved. The board's hard beat brought him to his senses at that first touch of his board to the water off the land. Wave strengths tossed him churlishly in water, white water back from where he had paddled. Again and again, again he was forced to acknowledge how the ocean could kill how it could drown him and grind his bones into the innumerable pebbles ashore, like skeletal wrecks he'd seen at low tide. So he didn't give up and paddled more and more. Sorely little progress he made, sore were his arms in the waves' fight. Uh, poop. Uh, the vision which had spurred him on on land was washed away in the wave's fight, when before a huge wave he surged to, fearing it would crush all his hopes, tipping up and up and through, he glimpsed calm, softly swelling ocean past the break. Then, by then, he was grateful, only grateful, for the sea's mighty, merciful spirit. He paddled on, quietly out, past the chant, further out, past the chant surge of any monster wave, until he came into his vast ignorance of the infinite depths of the waters of earth. In that delicate fear, he turned his board and paddled closer to the shore, within chance of a breaking wave. To surf a wave is a treasure within our souls. We dance along the mercy, abreast the mercy of our Lord, be it atop a board, along a swell, supply surging beneath us, beside us, around us. This ecstasy of life is what we are all, my God, a part of. So, that's surfer. <laughs> <clears throat> And the last one, oh, the last one, uh, I was telling Corey earlier that uh, somebody actually said, this is the best poem you ever sent me, who accused me of writing 16th century poetry, which I, I took, I tried to take as a compliment. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, so it goes like this. It's called Day by Day. It seems to me wisdom to know how fell I am so that I trust not my low self, but trust the way to eternal wealth. It seems to me men create, uh, see, <laughs> should have rehearsed this, I just memorized it this morning. It seems to me men create living hell in all their selfish schemes to buy and sell. 
blinding themselves to just compassion's health as their eyes grow wide when they see sin's pelf. But you, Lord, guide us to love and love well. It seems to me great wisdom to forgive when others rob us in our words or deeds. For you, Lord, reward us by forgiveness and credit our accounts so we may live secure in meek wealth, replete for our needs, your beacons in our ordinariness. Thank you. Um, that was fun. It was fun to hear some of your other stuff that we don't normally get to hear. I had no idea you were a surfer. Oh, yeah. I was. Okay. The sharks <laughs> kick me off now. Yeah, they do that, sharks. Not so fun. Um, let's see. Ann Schaffmaster, would you like to go next? Awesome. Ann Schaffmaster. going to read two poems. Um, the first is called Ballerina and the second is called Dragons. Ballerina. The house up on the hill with a picket fence of white birch trees to block the view and the cellar with a barrel of sour pickles in a back room and the rotisserie next to the damp wall. Go down there in pirouette Half an hour will do. I sulk and pretend to be a famous ballerina, Anna Pavlova, Margot Fontaine, but I look like a tomato. <laughs> There's a train set on the table, outline of a depot in the blackout below. The furnace clanks on and off while I whirl myself dizzy on my toes and see bright lights like Broadway aglow. My mother has left the door ajar. She is talking on the phone in the voice she uses for everyone else. My arms ache as my legs twist around my out of plumb body and flee the ground. I don't remember when I first stopped twirling, when I first stood still. But one day, I sat down on that cold cement floor, lost already but present in this world. Um, next one is called Dragons. Sitting at the table is my handyman's young son. He is killing dragons on his laptop, which bothers me. It is this killing of dragons over and over again that has taken him away to some place other than my kitchen, to some place where he needs to be. His father is assembling a treadmill from Amazon. I can hear him swearing, even though he's on the other side of the house. I used to think that the swearing men do when they are working on something meant that they were about to blow their top or that something got broken, but it means nothing. It is simply something men do. It is how they fight dragons. Now me, I cry over just about anything. It's as if my heart were a wet sponge that periodically needs to drip. Outside, the wind stirs the leaves. I know that we move in our own space. It's the one that is both savage and kind. I won, the little boy says this small child who can already see things forbidden to me. Thank you. Thank you. Let's see, um, Corey, would you like to go next? All right, Corey Cook, everybody.
All right. I think I'm going to do three short poems, and then I'm going to read another by uh, Grace Paley. Uh, this one is called The Army Captain at Home. Screen door slams. Seconds later, he rounds the corner of the house. Laundry basket lodged under his left arm. Steam rising from cloth diapers. He approaches the line. Clothespins stand at attention. <laughs> for the friend that helped me with my spelling in school. Your, your mugshot made the 11 o'clock news. Pulled over for talking on your cell phone. Arrested after they found cocaine and drug paraphernalia in your car. Face still youthful. Hair tucked neatly behind your ears. Lips pursed. Eyes dark and distant like the silhouettes of a mother and father walking away from their child. You sat right behind me in school, blonde hair teased, clad in umbros regardless of the season. Helped me spell hundreds and hundreds of words. Words like recovery, stability, maybe even prosperity. Um, and the last one is called Conservation Camp, um, which is a camp that my parents made me go to when I was a kid. <laughs> my dad was a hunter, so he thought that I should learn how to hunt and track and all those kinds of things. I actually am, as an adult, grateful to have gone, but I was not happy about it at the time. Conservation Camp. Conservation camp meant catching sunfish and smacking them against smooth rocks. Poking piles of scat with sticks meant muffled laughter as the buck mounted the doe in the movie reel. Blowing quarter-sized holes in the replica of a deer with muzzle loaders meant comparing the flies we were tying to the youngest boy's sprouting pubic hair. Slicing open rainbow trout and swiping their innards onto the ground meant ignoring my cabin mates as they chided the fat boy for crying because he missed his mother, climbing down from my canvas bunk, placing my hand on his shoulder and saying, you'll see her soon, soon. Um, and this, this poem is called On Occasion. It's from Grace Paley's last collection of poems, Fidelity. On Occasion. I forget the names of my friends and the names of the flowers in my garden. My friends remind me grace. It's us. The flowers just stand there stunned by the sun. A long time ago, my mother said, darling, there are also wildflowers, but look, these I planted. My flowers are pink and rose and orange. They're sturdy. They make new petals every day to fill in their fat round faces. Suddenly, before thought, I called out zinnia, zinnia, zinnia. Along came a sunny summer breeze. They swayed, lightly bowed, I said, mother. Thanks. Um, let's see. Mark Bowen, would you like to go next? Yes. Mark Bowen. Um, I'm going to read um, some short poems that are part of a series that I've written based on a character who can't remember what he was hired to do. Um, highly influenced in my mind by John Berryman's dream songs and um, Zbigniew Herbert's Mr. Cujito poems. Um, 
the title of the series is called The Functionary, and but each poem is going to have its own standalone title. What is sometimes required? I've forgotten what I was hired for. It might have something to do with the romance between thought and sand, or why the moon looks constantly appalled. So in the meantime, I spend my nights raising to their feet people who've been stretched in a kind of prayer on the front steps of other people, singing in Pentecostal tongues the praises of who they themselves are to the glowing and deadly sky. And in doing, that, in, in doing so, I tell them that there are more appropriate places for that sort of thing. Feltschmerz. Some misgivings linger in the back corner until after last call, then seep out as a sly woman's voice. It's these that bring about the darkness of night and are the presence of everything that drowns sound out. There are people who like to keep them as if in a cup, swirling them around like unsweetened coffee. What else are hesitant acts and uncertainties for? Of course, I never claim them as my own for fear that those others will still w will wonder if they've hired the right man for the job. So instead, I give them sweeter names that sound like I'm coaxing a child to sleep, a child that it thinks that thinks it may be dying. Exile. I've come to a country whose citizens are living in constant states of fashionable languor, trading their goods of apocryphal juvenilia in exchange for a song that is a cry for the unfamiliar memory of silence. Through drastic misconceptions of my place in their lives, they begin offering up prayers to me, one of them telling me her fear that they are all the products of each other's dreaming and that one who she loves is yet someone else in the prolonged slumber of another's mind. Um, I've got a couple more. Um, desperate measures. After having worn out my welcome in a town that bases their fundamentals on the seven simple rules of spontaneous rapture, failing to possess the qualities necessary for three of them. I am again on my way under a sky whose color is a reminder that weeping is not the greatest expression of sadness, rather a complete lassitude. Yet on this road, pale and insufficiently paved, there is a music, a tempo that stops itself only in moments of juvenile exhaustion, raising the travelers along this way in their thoughts to a level that even something of beauty could never aspire to so that in its wake any transient stopping to rest will dream of having been the reason for all that just happened, having fallen asleep to its fading and toneless song. Um, and even though I haven't finished the series, I have written the last poem of the series, and that's this one. The transient rests. I stand in front of a small white church and listen to the sound coming between its doors hanging open like a sl slack jaw. These are the newer, more ecstatic forms of suffering. The building's paint is faded and peeling. The windows, arched like faces, caught in surprise, are insane with the dance of praising inside. Its steeple is a testament to a battle lost to a storm long ago. The birds flying over and around are the same as those in a prophecy told me by a beggar once. And even now, the distant mountains and approaching clouds are making things look ready for an end. I want to give up, to sit in the dirt where I am and go no farther. I want to go in and be one of them, to pray for things that had never worried me before, but I cannot move. Frozen with the thought that these, so in love even with the things they cannot see, must someday move on and be forgotten, to make room for something, only God knows what. Thanks. Thank you, Mark. Okay. All right, thank you all for being here and still being here and coming back after the little break. Um, and during the little break, I went, because in the first half, in addition to listening to all the poetry that was being presented, I was thinking, 
it's terrible that I don't have something of Toni Morrison to read. So I went and I Googled Toni Morrison quotes, and I came up with some. <laughs> and there's tons of wonderful ones, and I just want to read a few. Um, she really, I, yeah, she, she's, she was an amazing woman. So this is, this is a quote from the book Writing, Self, and Civilization. There is no time for despair, no place for self-pity, no need for silence, no room for fear. We speak, we write, we do language. That is how civilizations heal. I thought that was very appropriate for us. And this is from Art, Pain, no wait. This is, okay, so that, I was wrong in what that, that was from an article called, In Times of Dread, Artists Must Never Choose to Remain Silent. This is from an article called, No Place for Self-Pity, No Room for Fear. And the quote is, I know the world is bruised and bleeding, and though it is important not to ignore its pain, it is also critical to refuse to succumb to its malevolence. Like failure, chaos contains information that can lead to knowledge, even wisdom, like art. And a quote from the News Hour with Jim Lair, Toni Morrison said, all paradises, all utopias, are designed by who is not there by the people who are not allowed in. I think that's very interesting. Um, I tell my students, when you get these jobs that you have been so brilliantly trained for, just remember that your real job is that if you are free, you need to free somebody else. If you have some power, then your job is to empower somebody else. This is not just a grab bag candy game. Because um, you want to fly, you got to give up the things that weigh you down. No. Love is or it isn't. Thin love ain't no love at all. No, thin love ain't love at all. Sorry. Um, make a difference about something other than yourselves. I like this one. As you enter positions of trust and power, dream a little before you think. Mm -hmm. And this one kind of follows. I get angry about things, then go on and work. Your life is already artful, waiting, just waiting for you to make it art. Don't ever think I fell for you or fell over you. I didn't fall in love, I rose in it. We die. That may be the meaning of life. But we do language. That may be the measure of our lives. Just, just three more. I think all good art is political. None of the best writing, the best thoughts, have been anything other than that. Oppressive language does more than represent violence. It is violence. Does more than represent the limits of knowledge. It limits knowledge. And this is my favorite. At some point in life, the world's beauty becomes enough. You don't need to photograph, paint, or even remember it. It is enough. That's Toni Morrison. Okay. And she's a hard act to follow, so who should I say this next? <laughs> Bob Burgess! <laughs> There's Meg. Hello. Hello. 
You're sticking your tongue out at me again. Okay. So as some of you who have been here before know all too well, usually when I get up here, it's Mr. Gloom and Doom. And everything goes downhill and depressing and bad jokes and all the rest. So hopefully this will be a little relief from that. Uh, some of you who were here before may remember that last time Danell let everybody know that we did a very fulfilling presentation tribute to Mary Oliver about a couple of weeks ago at Artistry, which was a combination of poetry and dance uh, and all kinds of nice stuff. Uh, her stuff is so good uh, that they are worth reading again and again, and many people give different interpretations to their things. So before things go the way all things go in terms of memory, I want to give my own tribute to her. Some of these were heard there and some not. We're going to start with West Wind. You are young, so you know everything. You leap into the boat and begin rowing. But listen to me. Without fanfare, without embarrassment, without any doubt, I talk directly to your soul. Listen to me. Lift the oars from the water. Let your arms rest and your heart. And listen to me. There is life without love. It is not worth a bent penny or a scuffed shoe. It is not worth the body of a dead dog nine days unburied. So, when you hear a mile away and still out of sight, the churn of the water as it begins to swirl and roil, fretting around the sharp rocks, when you hear that unmistakable pounding when you feel the mist on your mouth and sense ahead the embattlement to come, the long falls plunging and steaming, then row, row for your life towards it. You do not have to be good. You do not have to walk on your knees for a hundred miles through the desert, repenting. You only have to let the soft animal of your body love what it loves. Tell me about despair, yours, and I will tell you mine. Meanwhile, the world goes on. Meanwhile, the sun and the clear pebbles of the rain are moving across the landscapes, over the prairies and the deep trees, the mountains and the rivers, Meanwhile, the wild geese, high in the clean blue air, are heading home again. Whoever you are, hmm? whoever you are, no matter how lonely, 
The world offers itself to your imagination, calls to you like the wild geese, harsh and exciting, over and over, announcing your place in the family of things. That, of course, is wild geese. Then we have the journey. So, one day you finally knew what you had to do and began, though the voices all around you kept shouting their bad advice, though the whole house began to tremble and you felt the old tug at your ankle. Men, my life, each voice cried, but you didn't stop. You knew what you had to do, though the wind pried with its stiff fingers at the very foundations, though their melancholy was terrible. It was already late enough and a wild night, and the road full of fallen branches and stones. But little by little, as you left their voices behind, the stars began to burn through the sheets of clouds. And there was a new voice, which you slowly recognized as your own, that kept you company as you strode deeper and deeper into the world, determined to do the only thing you could do determined to save the only life you could save. So, who made this world? Who made the swan and the black bear? Who made the grasshopper? This grasshopper, I mean, the one who has flung herself out of the grass, the one who is eating sugar out of my hand, who is moving her jaws back and forth instead of up and down, who is gazing around with her enormous and complicated eyes. Now, she lifts her pale forearms and thoroughly washes her face. Now she snaps her wings open and floats away. I don't know exactly what a prayer is, but I do know how to pay attention how to fall down in the grass, how to kneel down in the grass, how to be idle and blessed, how to stroll through the fields, which is what I have been doing all day. You tell me, what else should I have done doesn't everything die at last? And too soon? Tell me. Tell me. What is it you plan to do with your one wild and precious life? Thanks for listening. Thank you. Another wonderful soul who was lost to us this year, earlier this year. And about the interpretation thing, that poem, The Journey, I first heard that um, a few years ago, about 10 years after I got divorced. And it was like she was exactly writing what I was going through as I was leaving my husband. It's just amazing. So another interpretation for that particular poem. 
Um, let's see, Jennifer Grant, would you like to go next? So I um, play trivia at Salt Hill on Sunday nights, and um, they all, they pretty much never have any questions about poets, but they they um, did have a question related to rhyming recently, and I thought as the token rhymer in the group, <laughs> I would test out the trivia question on all of you. So the the answer is the name of the song, and in 1984, um, Ray Parker Jr. had a hit song, and when he was teased about it, he said. It's really hard to rhyme anything with fill in the blank, and that's the trivia uh -huh. question. Uh -huh. Anybody have a guess? Orange. Any other guesses? No, because that would give away the song. <laughs> Ghostbu Ghostbusters. <laughs> so when you <laughs> when you hear Ghostbusters from now on, you have to feel sympathetic to the writer because that's why it says Ghostbusters <laughs> over and over and over again. <laughs> but I decided to sort of take that. I do not have a poem about that, but I see that as like a future challenge to try to see if I can come up with something around with Ghostbuster. So, but that's not tonight's project. So, all right, uh, tonight's poem is called Chipped Dishes. Um, copyright Jennifer Grant, two thousand two. Revised 2019. I keep my chipped dishes. I use them a lot. I use them for guests, for Sundays, or not. I use them for breakfast, for lunch at midday. You might even see them at dinner today. Now don't think the chips are something I choose. I'd rather not have them on things that I use. But still, if they're found, on something that's mine, I just ignore them, and that works out fine. One woman I know tries a different tack. It's all for display, with chips to the back. The plates are all angled just ever so, quite certain that none of the chips ever show. The creamer sits high on a decorative shelf. The tureen's enclosed behind glass by itself. The tickler, of course, is she can't take them down. To use a chipped dish might elicit a frown. Another expresses a different view. Chipped dishes are goners. They're finished. They're through. They're tossed in the pail and out with the trash. First they were chipped, but now they are smashed. <laughs> the trouble with this is not hard to see, for then she needs new ones, perfect, chip-free. Now your turn comes. You have three options to choose, so I ask at your home, which one do you use? And if the last is the thing that you do, do you throw out your chipped people too? Mm -hmm. That's great. Um, I used to do pottery and um, I learned about in Japan, they, when there's a chip dish, they will often mend the chip with gold to accent the breakage because it becomes part of the history of the piece and it actually adds a precious element to it. So it's like part of the history of the thing to have the chipped bit. Um, it's not a very Western idea, but it's a cool idea. So. Okay, um, sorry I was so busy thinking about the chip dishes, I don't know who to... So, um, let's see, it, um, there's, is, who else would like to present something tonight? Okay, anyone else? Okay, then I think we're up to Scott Gordon. Okay, thank you. So I just want to go on record saying that Bob broke me into this. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Indeed. Um, <clears throat> okay, so I'll start with some William Blake and there'll be a little bit of a William Blake theme going through this. Um, 
Tiger, tiger, burning bright in the forest of the night, what immortal hand or eye dare frame thy fearful symmetry? And William Blake was famously quoted as saying, when I see the sun, I see the light of a thousand angels dancing. And so I want to tell you a story. So it's uh, called Double Yellow S. So when I was in college, I used to ride motorcycles. And um, I had some friends who also rode motorcycles, Fluffy and Anne, and they were a couple. And we did not usually ride together. But on this particular Saturday morning, um, <clears throat> it so happened that we decided we would ride together. And of course, Anne was a very careful rider, and I consider myself sort of just, you know, regular kind of motorcycle rider. But, you know, Fluffy was a bit of a daredevil. So pretty soon, uh, it turned into a passing game with motorcycles. And uh, we're going from Pasadena to Alhambra, which involves going on a long straight road called Los Robles. And so we're going down Los Robles, and at that particular moment, uh, Fluffy was about three cars ahead, and so I'm like, okay, I'll pass these first two cars, and I do that, and uh, then there's just one car, and by that point, I'm just about to pass Fluffy, and then the one car <clears throat> ahead is coming up on a big S-band, which I know quite well, having been around it a lot of times. And so in my head, I'm like, I could get ahead of Fluffy if I just would shoot the S, right? Because it's a blind corner. You can't see what's coming the other way. And there's big double yellows on the S. That's the name of the story, double yellow S. Um, <clears throat> so I decide I'll do that. I decide I'll shoot the lanes. And so if there's a car coming the other way, then the two cars will go on either side of me. But of course, what happens in an S is the same for everybody. They all want to shave the S. They all want to drift to the center of the S because that's the straightest path. So as I am passing the car in front of Fluffy, <clears throat> I see that another car is coming the other way. And I look to see if I can see the driver. And of course, I can't because it's a sunny day and the windshield's got a bunch of sun on it. Normally you try and make eye contact. You're like, oh, do you see me? Like, you know, what's going to happen in this situation? But I can't see anything. I can't see anyone. Um, just a shiny windshield. And then I catch a light off the bumper, which is in my frame of reference coming at me at 110 miles an hour because I'm doing about 65 and the car is doing 45 coming the other way. And the car I'm passing is doing 45. And so at 110 miles an hour, what I see is a large, shiny spot that grows and grows and gets brighter and brighter. And at that moment, I know that if I continue on this path, I'll die. And so I slam on my brakes and I get behind the car that I'm passing. But <clears throat> at that moment, he puts on his brakes too because he's coming into the S. And that's also another thing that people do when they come into an S is they slow down. So at that point, I'm behind the car that I'm passing, still in front of Fluffy, but going much faster than the car in front of me. So then it seems clear that I'm going to crash into the bumper of the car that I was just passing. So I lay the bike down, which is fairly straightforward. You just kind of get off, right? You just kick out the rear end and you just lay down on the pavement and I had leathers on and a helmet and you know good things like that but <clears throat> from my frame of reference what seemed to happen was I got off and I was on the pavement but the bike didn't leave right like the bike came back and I'm like well I better get off again and so this time I pushed the bike away with my left hand like this right and then I end up sliding about 150 feet down the road and wind up against the curb. And then Fluffy and Ann pull up and they're like, are you okay? And the car behind Fluffy pulls up and says, I saw sparks coming from your head. And I look at my helmet and there's a big gash down the back of my helmet. So for those of you that aren't sure, helmets are good. <laughs> um, and then, you know, Fluffy says, 
you know the bike flipped up 15 feet in the air and landed on top of you, right? And I said, no, I did not. And at that point, uh, we, got on, we left the bike there and I got on the back of Fluffy's bike and we went back to the dorm and later on it turned out that I'd not quite dislocated my shoulder but messed up my shoulder pretty good and broken one of the ribs over my heart, which I never got treated. So. So there's my story, double yellow S, or maybe how I saw an angel. Thank you, Scott. So I have one question. Do you still ride motorcycles? No. <laughs> Was that the end of your motorcycle uh, career? No, I rode after that, but not, not for very long. So is that everybody who would like to present something? Thank you all for being here. It's been a lovely evening. And we will meet again the first Tuesday night of September. Um, and just so everybody knows, we now have this wonderful screen and projector up there. So if anyone has any visuals or sound, because we also have a good sound system in this room, that they want to add to their thing, we can do that now, because we're very sophisticated. <laughs> <laughs>